Right, welcome uh, to this Orkney Heritage Society sponsored talk, which I hope you'll find very, very interesting. Uh, first thing to warn you is it's being filmed and hopefully that we'll have lots of questions um, at the end, but we'll uh, pass through the mic for, for doing that. Um, I think I think it was important to try and record this for posterity because hopefully it'll be a lot of interesting information. Um, I'm Spencer Rosie, by the way, a chair of the Heritage Society. I'm here to do the introduction. Um, I'm not introducing the speaker. He doesn't need introduction in Orkney, uh, but I will introduce the topic. Um, there is a lot of interesting uh, anniversaries uh, around this time. Like last year was the centenary of radio coming to Orkney. This year, a um, hundred years since uh, electricity became available in Kirkwall. Um, but it's uh, it's incredible to think that it's over half a century when we're, we were having the discussion around what effect uh, the oil would have on Orkney. Um, so we thought it very important that we should uh, mark, uh, mark that, uh, the occasion where, uh, you know, where, where local, local government and national uh, representatives were on the ball and were doing something positive about it. And I think it's a very timely reminder of uh, what happened 50 years ago. Before I hand you over to Howie, I would just like to thank him profusely for coming up specially um, uh, to do this talk. Fortunately, I think he had other um, things to do, which was uh, worked in will. But uh, uh, just a huge thank you to, to Howie for coming to do this talk. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to <laughs> And I'll be the Moose operator. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed, Spencer, and thank you warmly, everyone, for coming tonight. And indeed, it suddenly seems, you know, 50 years seems to have passed by very quickly. And I'd like to, to set the scene, first of all, in fact, going back even further back, because you could see North Sea oil, its arrival in Orkney, as part of an economic pattern that really goes back several thousand years. The reason is that Orkney's history seems over the centuries to swing between sometimes remoteness from the centre of things and at other times being right at the heart of it all, back and forth between these two extremes swinging through patterns of technology and trade. In the, the Neolithic, it was at the heart of things, part of a, a trade route from the Mediterranean through the Irish Sea. Then in the Bronze Age, it seems to have faded to the margins. Back it came when iron technology brought bigger ships with cargoes of iron tools and weapons. Later developed in ship technology and trading patterns put Orkney in the mainstream of the Great North trading network. But from about 1400, the Little Ice Age brought harsher weather conditions. And in times like the 1690, the years of starvation. Then. It swung again as demand for North American fur brought in the ships for Hudson's Bay and brought work opportunities for young Orcadians as well. Industrial demand for oil in the 19th century, this time whale oil for industry and home light, that demand opened up the 19th century Greenland whaling industry and more work opportunities for young Orcadians. And Demand for material to industry also led to the great kelp boom, which peaked during the Napoleonic Wars. But then swung again because the post-war kelp collapse led to Watney Laird's investing in new industries, expanding farming, developing herring fishing. In the 20th century, two world wars brought the strategic position of Scapa Flow to center stage. In World War II, Tens of thousands of service personnel were stationed in Orkney with the army garrisons, the four airfields, the Churchill Barrier workforce, and a whole new town at Linus. As light settled down in peacetime, the sheer relief of survival was gradually replaced by a feeling of economic decline as the busy wartime installations closed. 
One bright spot was the government's determination to build self-sufficiency in food to avoid any future naval risk to imported supplies, and the farm subsidies for expanding production were energetically taken up. But young folk also found greater opportunities elsewhere in Aberdeenshire or in Australia. Pattern of emigration grew that built to over a thousand people a year, came known as the drift from the Isles. An increasing number of young people went away to college or university to study and stayed away as there were so few skilled opportunities at home. Orkney's population gradually fell to around 17,000. This was really a time of post-war stagnation for the whole UK economy, with little government money to improve the standard of life, and there was growing frustration in the North Isles with a lack of funding for tear, mains water, and mains electricity. This was the time when the North Isles Association was formed to campaign energetically for improvements. Through this period, the two newspapers, the Acadian and the Orkney Herald, till it closed in the 60s, were both tireless in highlighting development and enterprise. And in that period, time and again, people in the community put their hands in their pockets to support new enterprises. For instance, fish factories in Westery, Rousey, Dronzy, to produce, process local catches and add value. Energetic people came forward with developments in farming, craft industries, tourism, fishing, knitting. The county council invested in a sea school in Stromness and in training for knitters. There were community initiatives across Orkney, from community associations, from business groups in Stromness. That included Stromness Shopping Week, founded in 1949, and then the building of a swimming pool. And overall, in this period, there was a real hunger for development across Orkney and a desire to see again the buzz of activity that had been there times in the past and a reversal of the apparent slow, the long, slow post-war decline. And why I went into some detail in that is so that you can see when the first mentions came in, North Sea Oil, in the early 90s, in the early 70s, there was a, a real quickening of the pulse and a hope among many people that Orkney could be involved. Looking back, you can now see the risk that amid such a demand for development, Orkney might have found itself having to make some compromises. And amazingly, it managed to secure both development and protection. And that was the key idea of the Orkney County Council Act. One factor helping the Orkney economy from the late 60s onwards was the establishment of a Highlands and Islands Development Board. Now, the recognition to that, the background, was recognising that the economic decline of the Highlands and Islands wasn't due to any lack of innovativeness or enterprising spirit, but simply the lack of investment capital. The opportunity to do something about it came after the 1964 general election, won by Harold Wilson and the Labour Party, with a majority of just four seats. At that election, the Liberals had emerged with six seats, enough to give them a vital negotiating position, and several of those seats were in the Highland, alongside the party's leader and MP for Orkney and Shetland, Joe Grimmond. He had led a great regeneration of the Liberals into a party of fresh thinking and new ideas, the Highlands and Islands Development Board was one of the planks of their manifesto. So, in 1965, the board was formed, and its investments soon began to make an impact, particularly for the fishing industry. But then, Labour got a big majority in the 66 election, and the Liberals' leverage disappeared. And there was soon concern about centralisation in Scotland. The Wheatley Commission on the Future of Local Government recommended large regions, with Orkney and Shetland absorbed into a new Highland Regional Council. There was opposition by all the various local political parties, and indeed by the whole community. And the Orkney and Shetland Tories put forward a motion at their annual conference for Orkney and Shetland to have their own all-purpose authorities. Against expectations, the Tories were elected in 1970, and Edward Heath 
found himself Prime Minister, and Edward Heath was a man of his word. The party had promised Orkney and Shetland to preserve their island status, and so he would honour their, their pledge. Indeed, he gave the Western Isle, long divided between Inverness and Ross and Cromarty, their own all-purpose authority as well. And from what I remember of the time and from what I read, I don't think that the Western Isles had actually particularly asked for it. But Heath was a man who was absolutely fair, and if two of the three islands got it, the third had to get it. And then the Western Isles, when they had the opportunity, took it and developed it very successfully. I mention Edward Heath because his integrity is key to the events that followed, as if he had not kept his word about local government reorganisation, there would have been no Orkney or Shetland County Council to respond to oil development. Everything would have gone through an office in Inverness. And indeed, his government enabled the two County Council Acts to be passed, the acts which opened the way for the smooth arrival of oil for the two island groups. And now dates become really important because a lot happens in a very short time. Edward Heath became Prime Minister in 1970, and the Local Government Scotland Act was passed in 1973. It meant the loss of the old town council of Kirkwall and Stromness, which had had wide-ranging powers. They had built houses, run water, sewerage, looked after street cleaning and street lights, and they also ran local abattoirs. Their powers went not to Inverness, but to the new Orkney Islands Council that took over in May 1975. Nationally, Edward Heath had inherited a long-standing post-war problem with the UK economy, which was summed up in the phrases balance of payments crisis and stop-go economy. If you kept the money supply down, the economy stagnated and stopped. But if you lowered interest rates to help expansion, increased prosperity led to an influx of imported goods and general price and, uh, and wage inflation. Now, one of the big imports was oil, and there were strategic concerns about this as well. There was dependence on Middle Eastern oil, and indeed in late 1973, a Middle East war and several months of an oil embargo. This added to the need to sustain coal production, but the government found themselves in conflict with the miners over wages, and indeed it was the miners' strike that eventually brought it down in 1974. So you can see now that nationally, for economic and strategic reasons, the discovery of North Sea oil was of huge potential benefit to the UK. The momentum began building in the 1960s with gas discoveries, and then in December 1969, the Ecofisk field was discovered in Norwegian waters, and the Montrose field was found east of Aberdeen. The following year came the 40s field, and then in 1971, the massive Brent field east of Shetland. So now, out to the east of Orkney, there was oil off Aberdeen, and there was oil off Shetland. And the question was, was there something in between? In 1973, January of that year, came the news of the discovery of the Piper Field. Now, the speed of development is amazing. This January 73, they discovered the Piper Field. The Occidental Consortium started to produce oil commercially at the end of December 76. And in the spring of 77, the Flotter Oil Terminal was operational. That's just over four years after the discovery of the Piper Field. I should say that there is a story about how Flotter was developed, the location for the oil terminal in Orkney. And it was told by a great friend of many of us here, uh, former Islands councillor Ian Scott, and it was Ian's uncle by marriage who was involved, and that was Captain John Hoorie of the local company Bremner, Hoorie and Gray, which provided the shipping service for the South Isle for Linus, Longhope and Flotter. Ian learned this story in Edinburgh, as John never told anyone in Orkney about it, and quote it now in Ian's own words. 
I was down at a meeting in the Scottish office on Orkney Islands Council business, when at lunch one of the senior civil servants came to me and asked, do you come from Orkney? And then asked if I knew of Tenhuri. I replied, yes, indeed I did. The civil servant then proceeded to tell me the remarkable story of how oil came to Plotta. On this particular day in the early 1970s, an American oil tycoon, Dr. Armand Hammer, flew into Edinburgh in his private TriStar jet. Dr. Hammer proceeded to the Scottish office and demanded to see the Secretary of State. He was promptly told the Secretary never sees anyone without a, a prior appointment, possibly arranged as much as a month before. He was asked what was his urgent business. He replied that he wanted to build an oil terminal on the east coast of Scotland. In the light of this information, the Secretary of State agreed to meet Dr. Hammer in his office. Of course, he called in all his advisors to do with major construction and development. However, Dr. Hammer asked, do any of you know anything about harbours with safe deep anchorages? Clearly, no one did. However, this civil servant, who was a junior at the time, whispered to the secretary that there was an experienced senior sea captain a few doors away, negotiating his annual grant to keep the lifeline ferry services going for the South Isles of Orkney. The Secretary of State immediately asked for Captain Hoori to be summoned into the meeting with Dr. Hammer. Very quickly, he and Dr. Hammer were just like long-lost friends, and when asked about safe, large harbour on the East Coast, John's reply was, there are really none of the size you want on the East Coast, but there is one in Orkney. Sharper Flow is a large, deep, natural harbour, and your very big tankers can easily swing at anchor. Dr. Hammer's reply was, OK, Captain, come and show me. They both took off in the TriStar to fly up low over Scarpa Flow and Flotter. And Ian rounded off by saying, this is how Flotter and Scarpa Flow became Orkney's oil terminal and harbour. And actually, I remember when Ian, he wrote this down, and when he told me the story, he remembered that there'd been a, a news item in the Arcadian around that, that time, uh, that would be the spring of 73, around that time, about, indeed, I think it came from a report from Flotta, about a um, plane that had appeared and flown over the, the flown, flown over the island for a considerable time. And when Ian mentioned it, I remember seeing it, and it's, I, I must look, look for it, but I'm sure there was a story, indeed, about this, this plane. And so, from this, it must have been Captain Hoori and, and Dr. Hammer aboard. And so that was in the spring. In July of that year, 1973, Occidental representatives came to Flotta to speak to the community and negotiate the purchase of the land. Meanwhile, the land situation in Shetland was becoming more complicated. Indeed, in Shetland, worry started to appear that things would easily go wrong. The oil development was happening so quickly that the UK itself did not have an overall energy policy, and neither Orkney nor Shetland had a local development plan. Shetland appointed consultants to produce an interim development plan, with oil development concentrated at the obvious site of Sulum Vo. But shortly after that plan was published, highlighting the key role of Sulum Vo, shortly after the plan was published, an announcement was made by a Glasgow-based firm of private developers to say they just bought 5,000 acres in the development area, exactly the area specified by the Shetland Council, and they would be very willing to provide facilities for oil development to the industry. Suddenly, it was realized that there were potentially a lot more players in the game, and that highlighted a key question of how to protect the island's environment and economy. There's a fascinating book published in 1976 in Shetland by a local publisher, Thulprint. There it is, The Shetland Way of Oil, Reactions of a Small Community to Big Business. It was published locally, edited by John Button. 
It was written just a couple of years after the development of the Orkney and Zetland County Council Acts, but it brings out issues that were very much to the fore at the time. Two chapters in the book look at the experience of Milford Haven, which had become the UK's largest oil port and was partly within the boundaries of a beautiful national park. One chapter, written by the founder of Shetland Bird Club, notes that if Sulem Vaux Terminal were to experience oil spills at the same rate as Milford Haven, there would be an average quantity spilled of between 400 and 1,200 tonnes a year. Another chapter in the book by a university researcher lists the problems at Milford Haven. And he says that, quote, they demonstrate the weakness of county council planning controls. And he ends the chapter by saying, if the people of Shetland wish to avoid some of the traumas of the Milford Haven experience, they must demonstrate effectively and persistently that conservation is a necessity. Now, this is a key phrase in terms of oil operations, the phrase, the weakness of county council planning controls. The problem was that the only power that the law gave the Orkney and Shetland county councils was planning controls, and they are so limited. Now, you can see why, because so many in an oil operation, so many different agencies are involved. An oil tanker may be owned in one country, registered in another country. Similarly, the pilots that guide it, the tugs that move it in and out of the harbour, and indeed the whole harbour operation itself could be run by a company owned, by, uh, owned, at, owned at a distance. And so on a dark winter's day, among unsettled weather, with pressure to sail, there's a whole chain of people and organizations who are going to be involved in making decisions. That is exactly the kind of situation where things go wrong and where from time to time we read in the media about the progress of public inquiries, which go into the causal sequence of what went wrong and round off with some hardly comforting words about lessons being learned. So it was clear that the only way that Orkney and Shetland could be guaranteed the maximum of safety would be if the local authorities ran the towage, pilotage, and harbour. But that would mean there would be a single locally responsible decision-making making structure that would follow the agreed procedures to the letter. This looked to be a just about impossible key to put to the oil companies and indeed to government departments. How could two small local authorities, the smaller in the UK, seek power to do the kind of things that specialist companies were looking after elsewhere. Also, when everyone wanted the development to go ahead quickly, and indeed it was very much in the UK's national interest, both could these two small local authorities manage to get the ear of government for their case to be made. But in a way, the need for speed worked both ways. The councils pointed out to the oil companies and to the government departments, the biggest obstacle to speed in developments like this comes from the nature of the planning process. Right across the UK, a development on this scale usually attracts a mass of objections. Some are local, some are national. This then means that the planning process can be dragged out over years, it can include a formal lengthy planning inquiry with a reporter reporting to the government. The whole process takes years. And for oil terminals in Orkney and Shetland, you could expect that a sizable proportion of the objections leading to a long process, a sizable proportion would be on the risk of oil spillage. So the county council's argument was this, if comprehensive system preventing spillage could be put in place and seem to be better than anything elsewhere, then that would be a huge step in removing so many potential objections to the development. That then could enable the two local authorities and their communities to get 
completely behind the oil development, the speed that the companies and the government needed. So the paradox was that speed on the one hand looked, the need for speed looked to be against the two councils, but they turned it to advantage by pointing out that if they could reconcile the development with potential objections, the process could be speeded up. There was also the question of land. It was clear that impending oil development would lead to land speculation, as indeed it did in Shetland. And that then would lead to problems and delays for both the oil, for the local authorities and the oil companies, simply in negotiating with different owners. You could imagine if you want to build an oil terminal on land and you find that somebody owns one part of the land, somebody owns the other, or that the land, the person who's bought it, simply sits back and decides to push and push for more and more money. So, if, however, the two councils would have the power to acquire the necessary land and then lease it to the oil companies, that would be to everyone's benefit. It would again simplify, greatly simplify it for the oil companies because they would be clear of all the procedure in, in arranging the land. But there were benefits locally because the council would get added control in terms of the landlord-tenant relation. It also would mean that when eventually the oil development ended, when the terminal closed, the ownership of the terminals would revert to the landowners, the local authorities, rather than the terminals be sold elsewhere and sites fall into decay. So the two county councils were going to need additional power very quickly. How do the two smallest local authorities in the country, out of the blue, get additional powers? Well, they took advice and they were told that the appropriate way would be through private legislation. For each of the two to put forward a private bill at Westminster. This would require contracting a firm of parliamentary agents, the firm would then take forward the bill through the various stages, including the formation of a select committee of MPs. And just reading the story today, it's just so incredible that it's, it's still difficult to see how they possibly could have done it. They were seeking powers possessed by no other local authority. And indeed, some strong opposition was voiced by some senior civil servants about the scale of these powers. They had just three things going for them. One, as we'd mentioned, the recognized need, the economic and the strategic, political and the strategic need for the UK to get North Sea oil on stream fast. Secondly, there was the clear skill and commitment of the officials and the councillors in Orkney and Shetland. And they also had a third one. This was the political position of Joe Grimmond. Although he'd stepped down as Liberal leader in 1967, after three general elections, he had over two decades of experience and he was widely respected across the political spectrum at Westminster. And he very skillfully at various stages used his knowledge and his contacts and simply his understanding of how the system worked to ensure that obstacles were smoothly negotiated. For instance, at one stage, there was lobbying about, about the powers of compulsory land purchase. That resulted in the select committee chairman giving a casting vote against it. Joe Grimmond, however, was able to intervene and somehow, and very successfully, make the case for that vital clause about compulsory land purchase to be reinstated. Another story I heard from um, somebody, in fact, who was there. Um, on this particular occasion, a detailed report had been prepared for the committee by Shetland County Council on a key issue. Because of the scale of what was needed, it only arrived in time when Joe Grimmond was due to go into the meeting. He had just the briefest of times to skim through the document to pick up the key points in it, identify them, and then to set them out to the committee and convince them. So the, 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 going back on this, this, in fact, there's a number of cases where, rep and similarly representatives from both Shetland 
County Council and Orkney County Council, councillors and officials, by sheer personal ability, managed actually to convince key people to go along with what was decided. And out of it, and in such a short time, those two private bills continued on their way and they became law in 1974 at the Vetland County Council Act and the Orkney County Council Act. And we can look at them now, and ben has got them there on the screen. You see it starts, it's an act, it authorizes the, the County Council to exercise harbor jurisdiction. And then again, power to acquire land compulsory and for other purposes. And then you can go on, you see it says the council is entrusted by the government, stable agricultural economy, threatened, it's quite open, threatened for the first time with potential industrial development on an extensive scale, avoid it causing problems, it specifies, and also B is, is making the point that adequate services can be provided. And that makes the, the national point there, that adequate services can be provided within the limits of the county's available finances. And so it's it's highlighting protection, but it's also highlighting the need. It goes on, you can see in five there, and we can look at section five, just there, spent, I think, five. The power then developing harbor, this harbor jurisdiction. And you can see that it's not easy to produce this legislation because in six, there are various other pieces of legislation that this has actually got to overtake. You see, there's there's other legislation, the role of the Queen's Harbour Master. Then seven produces the, the the layout, and we'll come back. That we just I've just skimmed very quickly because I was going to say that later uh, we can, if there's anybody's got questions about particular parts of that, we can we can go and highlight. I think actually, I hope it would be rather good if that was even. I don't know, published, you know, because it's something, in a way, it is part of, part of our, our our heritage. That that I, and it, I find it now quite fascinating. I think at the time, I would probably have thought it a fairly something prosaic. But now, having heard about how those powers were won, the sheer effort and, and commitment that put into winning them, I find that these clauses really matter. We'll, we'll look in a moment at um, another part of, of the Act. Because there was one thing more that was needed. However carefully handled, the arrival of oil development was going to cause disturbance. Now, there could be physical disturbance, for instance, to roads and road users. There would also be a need for new houses and extra school classrooms. And there would be a potential overheating of the local economies. Because skilled people were likely to be attracted from existing local industries, and then those existing industries would be forced to raise wages to try to keep the people. And so there is that risk of overheating of the economy. That could be long term. And there was also difficult transition that one day would have to be faced when the oil from the fields finally ceased to flow. And therefore, those jobs and all that economic impact into the Orkney economy would vanish. And the question is, what would fill the gap? Well, the only way to fill the gap is to have capital to invest. And in a way, it's almost a parallel to the story of the Highland Board that I met earlier. When the board arrived, brought capital in, and it enabled a, a, a development in the economy and a creation of jobs. So there needed to be a mechanism by which capital, substantial amount of capital, could be brought in when the time came for the two oil terminals to close. Then, for all these reasons, the two county councils were going to need money. Now, there was, um, I mentioned in a moment, a payment on a barrel, a payment per ton, in fact, on oil that could cover it. The oil company were, were willing to pay. So there were, it was possible to get money from the oil company, but huge and apparently insuperable problem came from the nature of the local authority financial system. The reason is that the local authority system is not geared to handling new sources of income. 
local authorities generate some money from local taxation, such as business rates, and today the council tax, but this only covers part of their expenditure needs. That leaves a shortfall for central government to make up. So if local authorities get an increase in income coming from external money, all that does is reduce the shortfall that the government has to make up. So there's no benefit to the local authority. The benefit is direct to central government. Only solution to that would be to create a system where the councils could have a new type fund, separate type of fund, totally separate from the main county fund into which all that existing revenue went. And this new system would be a reserve fund into which they could put income and profits from oil activity without it in any way being counted against them when central government looked at what was needed to cover their annual shortfall from the rates. It also was a reserve for the day when oil went. And we'll get that and we'll find that, in fact, and spent, I think, if you're looking at um, page, section 69, page 32, we'll come on to it. I'll just do a little more background in the meantime. As I mentioned, the oil companies were happy to go. Occidental agreed to pay two pence per ton on oil processed at Flotter. But at this point, the government dug in. Now, those involved at the time say the government was reasonably happy to give powers to set up the harbour operations, but the government was concerned about how the council might spend the money. Governments always worry about local authority spending. They might spend them spend the money on something that the government feels that they, they shouldn't. There was also concern in Orkney Islands Council in the Finance Department, and for a different reason. The Finance Department argued there didn't seem to be much point in Orkney getting a special fund unless the Council had very wide powers on how to spend it. Indeed, if wide powers were not granted, it was conceivable that some future government could support grant to the council on the basis that the council had some money of its own. So from the finance department came a short memo to say that the contributions from the operations of the harbour would be spent on anything which the council believed was in its opinion to the benefit of the inhabitants of Orkney as a whole. I mean, that was a tremendous thing to do. It was wide. And I think that when that was put forward, they reckoned that was right, but I don't think they felt they had much chance of getting it. However, the Orkney negotiators to that to the parliamentary committee, and again, how they did it, I don't know, but when the Act was passed, we've got it here, I think, just back there, section 67, 69, just a wee bit back to section 69, there it is. You see, if in respect of any financial year, the money is received by the council on account of the revenue of the undertaking. Now, the undertaking is defined in the Act as the whole thing, anything that the council do under this Act. That means the whole harbour operation or whatever. If the monies, uh, in, it's a, if they exceed, if the revenue exceeds income, the council may take out of the standard county county fund and carry and put it in the reserve fund, such a sum as they consider reasonable. Entirely up to them. The only thing is they can't feed the amount of income, and that's fair enough. In other words, they can't take ratepayers' money or council tax money and take it out of out of the system. But anything excess, anything, any bonus, they can take that out of the system and they can put it in this fund, long-term fund, that is, and in a moment we'll see what it could be spent on, it can be invested too, that it can be invested in any securities, to 3A, that it can make good any deficiency in the income resulting from the undertaking. It's not any income, it's, it's not simply mopping up any losses, but any deficiency from the undertaking from oil. B, 
any claim, if something goes wrong, if the council's under pressure because of the oil operation, it can go for the reserve fund. Now C, just moving on a wee bit, and the Spencer, defraying any expenditure. I can go on to D, plant, equipment, all the part of the undertaking, anything to do with the harbour can spend. But there's this wonderful E. And this was the one that came, that was drafted, um, this short memo was drafted, taken by the council negotiator. It's quite remarkable to get that through because you as I say you can imagine um, cautious civil servants wondering what the council might spend its money on. But it's absolutely clear any other purpose which in the opinion of the council is solely in the interests of the county or its inhabitants and it's in the interests of the council, the council judge. The new fund was called a reserve fund because it was in reserve for what the long term. But it's very important to note that this is not the same thing the so-called reserves that other local authorities have. You sometimes see tables in newspapers of lists of reserves, and sometimes they highlight authorities that seem to have a lot, lot of money. And that can be because the local authority has set slightly too high a figure on its rates and has got a surplus, or something's happened and it's had less expenditure, and it's sitting with some money that's accumulated from the rates and from the accounts of banks. And if that keeps happening, the, the rate payers express concern and the central government expresses concern. But the reserve funds of Orkney and Shetland are very different. They're a long-term guarantee for the authority and they have a role like a pension fund or company. And so both Orkney and Shetland object strongly when central government ever includes the reserve funds in tables of financial reserves of local authorities generally. They're not due, they're not the same, the same as budgetary surpluses in anywhere else. Further, in various government, central government grant schemes which require match funding, if an applicant gets help from the Orkney or Shetland Reserve Fund, it doesn't come as public sector support since it's not from the standard local authority budget. Now, these are key issues. And at times over the years since the passing of the Acts, the Orkney and Shetland officials have had to dig in on them. And that, that this is the point the reserve funds are not a windfall to be disposed of, but a vital tool to enable the local authority economies to cope with changing situations. Orkney County Council, which achieved such an incredible amount, was at the time so small that its main offices were in the building just along Broad Street that was recently the real. The whole council used to meet in the upstairs room there. It had two or three small departmental offices spread around council, and when, in May 1975, New Island's Council took over and gradually built up its resources, one of its immediate needs was to gather up its offices into one unit. This became possible when a new Kako Grange room was built and the old buildings were vacated. But before then, a huge amount of work had to be done, put in place all the harbour's infrastructure. It was a colossal commitment. Orkney and Shetland had made, they had guaranteed that they would set up a complete oil harbour with towage, pilotage, shore operations up to the highest international standard, and that had to be done ahead of the opening of the flood oil terminal in the spring of 1977. And then in addition, they had to process the planning requirements for the terminal, including its landscaping. It was an immense amount of work. The reserve fund was got up and running, and it was first of all managed by three councillors with business experience who were termed the three wise men. Then, full economic development committee, guided by an economist, managed the fund, and numerous schemes were put in place to maximise the benefit so that the reserve fund could make a contribution as match funding that could then unlock often a considerably bigger contribution from external agencies. It's fair to say that right across the whole of Orkney, the Reserve Fund has made a huge difference in taking industries forward and supporting many high-class community projects. 
One further benefit of the two County Council Acts was that they made for very good working relationships between the local authorities and the oil companies because the procedures were very clear and the relationship was very well defined. And in addition, local councillors and officials deserve a lot of credit for really working hard to build on this very good, effective relationship. Now, the companies benefited because the councils were taking on responsibilities and providing the necessary infrastructure and setting down clear and fair procedures, which helped the smooth development of the oil terminals. But the benefit for the councils was that if any of the problem, any problems emerged, the oil companies recognised they needed to assist the council <laughs> solve them. And when, for instance, problems emerge in Flotta with the sheer scale of the construction operation, both sides worked to get solutions to help the community. And Occidental set up a community relations section, which over the years worked quietly and effectively to resolve difficulties, build relationships. And these are also some more of the unsung heroes in the story. There was also a policy to employ local staff, and many skilled Arcadians returned from distant places to take up work on Flotta. Workers from elsewhere settled in Orkney and became part of the community, and many, many links have grown up lasting into today and continuing into the future. And just as one example, the requirements for independent environmental monitoring and water treatment started up university links that have led to the development of ICIT in strongness and the whole flowering of university activity and to much impetus for people and organisations in the renewable sector. Now, of course, there have been many changes to life in Orton, but what stands out, I find today, when looking back, is actually the might have been the, the things that could have gone wrong. And the things that, in the absence of the, the huge effort that went into the Orton County Council Act, look to have been all too lightly. It really would be an interesting exercise to write an alternative history in all, of all in which the County Council Act never happened, and that would be quite disturbing. The scale of appreciation that we owe to the two County Councils for their collaboration is really so great, it's difficult to put it into words. Sadly, so few of the councillors and officials from that time are left today. And I do think that a nice thought would be during this 50th anniversary year, it would be great if there was some way in which as a community we could all express a huge and, and heartfelt collective thank you. And as we look back, it's also important from our position today, looking to the future, as we look back, it's important to study how they did it. There seem to have been several steps. One, identify all the players and what they want and look at the big national picture. Two, look forward to the benefits, but first, think what could go wrong on the basis that if you can head that off, everyone will benefit. Three, sum up what can go wrong in a list of overall risks to the community that absolutely have to be avoided. Four, assess the adequacy of the existing mechanisms to protect against those risks and identify the areas in which those mechanisms may fall short. Because each shortfall where existing mechanisms fail, each the existence of each such shortfall creates uncertainty, and that's to the ultimate loss of all parties. Five, look for a way to fill the gap. And by filling the gap, bring stability into the situation. Six, fit the pieces together so that each of the key players can see how they can get what they want in a way that might turn out to be actually better than if they had to do it on their own. In other words, the big danger in situations of big potential development, the big danger isn't necessary from the direct needs of central government or the demand of big companies. It's more indirect. The big danger is if there's a lack of clarity as to what can be done and what can't. And then whoever brings clarity to such a situation can bring stability, and that can bring a development, a direction that can benefit everyone. 
And then that leads, of course, to the question of whether there are situations in which we can apply the same approach today. And of course, locally, we have possible big developments on the, the scale of renewables, yeah. and potentially on the equivalent scale of oil. And in fact, the more you look at the history, the more you see how great development in renewables emerged from the oil of people, institutions and the rural enterprise. And I do think that Orkney's renewables industry has developed magnificently to provide skilled jobs, rewarding jobs to skilled people. It's taken up, it's offers the promise to continue the direction that oil provided and continuing that tradition that it, that young people have a future here, the opposite of the tradition that I can remember so clearly back in the 1960s when getting on was equated to going away. The renewables benefits have spread through the community. Example with um, marine, the, for marine, the development of marine support, the community and based community of turbines in various islands. In an uncertain world, the renewables industry offers great opportunities for Orkney's future and for companies keen to develop. So the question is, can we look then with the knowledge of oil, can we look, look at the renewables industry today as the, the county council would have looked in, in, in oil 50 years ago, looking at the benefits that we want so much and the essential development of the industry, but also facing up to the fact that there might there might be glitches somewhere. And in renewables, you can see one of the problems that actually is a bit similar to oil in that there are a lot of players and there are a lot of complex interactions. And the fragmented nature of the electricity industry is something that's been commented about in various times by various professional institutions. And it seems that, for instance, because of the complex players, it's not easy to get them all around the table. There are private companies, public companies, government agencies. So that is potentially a problem. That means that there's a potential for something to go wrong. And a question, and this is other people who know much more about me may say the question has been answered, but just from a lay person reading a newspaper, I I get the feeling that the position of a Huffinstown substation seems to have emerged in relation to one current development. The question that comes to my mind is that location the right one for future developments? To me, a central location means that cabling is always going to, every development is going to have, if, if, if it's in the center of all, every development is going to have cable. And I don't know, but I, I think that the location is vital because the question is, is it there for a long-term plan? And it's, after all, with the oil terminals, their location was chosen for, for a long-term basis because everyone knew that that was the right place. Uh, again, I'd like to compare oil and renewable core elements. First, there's the location of the energy production and the storage, the, the terminal or the, the, the energy producer. And then there's the transfer of that energy to the market elsewhere. Now, for the oil industry, the first step was more straightforward with the terminal since it involved purely the, the oil company. The second step involved tankers and towage and pilotage and harbours. And through the risk of bringing in several other parties, you could see that where things could go wrong. But those risks were in no one's interest. Companies didn't want the risks. The community didn't want them. The com companies didn't want them because it would lead to planning objections. So for both sides, to solve those problems was worthwhile. In, I guess in renewables in Orkney, the wind farms are more straightforward since they can be developed on zoned land. Each involved a single company. The, the council planners can assess and decide. But the transmission lines from them involve other agencies with the council's control. 
And therefore, there's a risk that overhead power cables can appear on a scale inappropriate to the local flat Orkney landscape. And the danger is that they don't appear because of a chain of events in which people negotiate. They can appear because of a, a sequence that happens involving players at, at a distance. I do think that, I, 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 in a moment I'll draw an analogy, but I do think that if one single powering electricity pole were to appear in Orkney, it could do great damage to the future of the renewables industry, simply because it would lead to a storm of protest. And it's one of the news stories that the media love. I remember back in the 1970s, there was a government plan to cull grey seals. Yeah. And the protests and the underlying issues were a rich source of news for the, the world's media. And that was the end of the seal cull. And there's never been, uh, the subject has never been mentioned mentioned since. Orney then and now is an ideal place for media coverage since it's suitably far from the urban centres to be interesting, but near enough to be able to book a flight for a camera team. So something that might simply be one standard, one electricity pole that might be a standard for the industry might, in publicity terms, be amplified by the media to the equivalent of an oil spill. That would damage the renewables industry nationally and locally, and it could undermine the tremendous achievements of Orkney's renewable sector over several decades. It would also very likely ensure that every renewables application from then on would be opposed by a mass of local and national objections, and that would be to nobody's benefit. So there is the problem of the fragmentation of the electricity industry. So what can we do? Well. The lesson from oil is clear. Somebody has to step in and create a stable structure in which all the various players can be helped to attain their goals. With the fragmentation and gap, somebody has got to draw up an overall plan that removes them and bring clarity that benefits everyone. I do think the only organization that can do this is Orkney Island Council. So my thought on it, and I'm sure if the others here will know better than me and might not, might not agree or might look at it differently, but I think the council needs as a matter of urgency to draw up an energy development plan, to do it very quickly in a matter of months and plan not to be within the scope of the existing legislative structure, but the plan has to look and say, what is the ideal? And if that means uh, killer additional powers for the council to build that in. And as I say, ultimately, this is being that would the aim is to assist. The aim is to assist the industry and the aim is to assist the national aims. And the plan would also would need to identify power. Uh, in parallel, I do think that the council, it would be worth approaching central government now to seek assistance with such, simply say, powers are going to be needed. Now, it is more complicated than 50 years ago, since the various powers are split between two governments. There's energy issues at Westminster, planning issues at Holyrood. But I do think just by approaching the governments, that would take the first step towards bringing stability to the situation and to bringing players around the, the table. I'd say, too, that if you look at the parallel with oil tankers, where the council run all the marine operations and have done that so superbly, the council and the various agencies, all the parties involved, has, it has been so well done over the years. The equivalent to renewables seems to me to be that the council should seek overall powers over all aspects of transmission lines. Because that's the parallel, the transmission lines, the parallel between the harbour operations and the shipment of oil, and the transmission lines are where you get various agencies, various factors, and the potential for something to go wrong. 
If the council could seek powers over transmission lines, exactly the same as the harbors, towage and pilotage powers, exact parallel, if they could do that, they might, for instance, do it in partnership with a specialist company, which they could be bring in, as is done in, was done in the towage. And one further point, the former county council, in addition to that huge amount of work in enabling oil to come smoothly to Orkney, identified a need for housing. And that was carried on by the Islands Council. A lot of houses were built. At the time that Meadowbank, a big area of Kirkwall, developed. Just thinking back at that time, I can remember a really good house in Stromness and Kirkwall with about £3,000. You could get a really good house. And that was about two to three times the average wage. Now we're told an average house costs, I find this unbelievable, £200,000. There's a housing shortage so serious that it will, serious, it will really hold back any new development. So an energy development plan has to lead into an overall infrastructure plan. But these are only my thoughts about the present day inspired by looking back into the past with total respect and total admiration. We had a rare historical moment in Orkney and Shetland 50 years ago, when our future could have gone into one of two diverging directions. And it may be that only now we can see what those visionary and dedicated people saw were the extent of the risks. They guided us down the path that leads today. We owe them so much. We have this added benefit. We can learn how they approach the challenges of their time. We can see how that same approach, totally positive, totally collaborative, can work for us in new situations today. But to round off, I'd simply say what we owe them is so great that we could only express warmest, heartfelt appreciation. <laughs> I'm sure there are bound to be loads of questions or comments. Um, does somebody want to kick off? Um, any questions? I'm going to ask the question. I'm sure we're all wondering what, who are the three wise men. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you that. Um, how they, were, how they were chosen. Um, one was Jackie Brown, a retired bank manager. One was Alistair Scholes, an accountant. And then that was the two people in finance. And then the third one was Ewan Trail because he represented the area where the, where the oil came from. So those were, the, those were the original three wise men. And then, then came the Economic Development Committee. I'm not quite sure when the Economic Development Committee was set up. I, Quite early on, the, the director of finance said it was really important for the council to get an economist to manage the, the reserve fund. I think a lot would have, a lot of the structure would have come in in the late late seventies. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, <laughs> this is one that's always the. Uh, uh, Complex me. It's the why, why are there differences between the Orkney County Council Act and the, the Zetland County Council Act? I mean, in the, the one that the most obvious is the, the harbour areas. The, the the fact in Orkney it's the double flow in Kirkwall, uh, but in Shetland it's basically the, the curve mile limit everywhere. I should wonder why there is a, a, a difference in that. You know, that that is a really good question. I don't know. Um, I have to, to say that I hadn't really studied the Zetland Act in, in the detail. I should, I just have an overview. And I'd like, I, I will try to find out, but of course it's very difficult now to find out because there are so few, so pe few people left from, left from that, that time. One, one thing I guess, and I do think the land situation in Orkney and the land situation in Shetland were quite different because in Shetland, there was the, the example I mentioned about the property developing firm that suddenly out of the blue 
um, announced that it owned 5,000 of acres of land in an absolutely key area. Whereas Orney, because of the, the chain of events, things happened so quietly. Um, you know, I'm thinking in the time scale, January 73, um, the Piper Fields discovered the, the flight, Dr. Hammer flight comes in the spring of that year, July, you go and see the people in Florida. I think it's, and I think that must have been after Sulambo as well. And by that time, the work on the acts were coming on. So I, it does seem that the land situation in Orkney anyway was much less complex than the, the land situation in Shetland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, in your time reading through the Act and, and discussing it and thinking about it, are there any parts of it that you think have gone undelivered or have been unsuccessful? And then as an addendum to that, are there any parts of the Act you think that are still could be used today or still relevant that aren't being done so um, currently? Oh, that's interesting. That is interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought that about that, but that's a really interesting question. I guess, I think one thing that is really good is to actually just highlight the act. And um, it's maybe like giving confidence. I mean, this, this is a very powerful one E about the opinion of the council is solely in the interests of the council or its inhabitants. That's a really, really, a really powerful one. And I also know that, as I mentioned from time to time, there are sometimes disagreements between the finance departments of the council, of the council of Orkney and Shetland, and central government. And sometimes, you know, it's natural to assume that if its point of view is represented by central government on an issue, you think the government probably is right, but. Looking at it, the issues on which the finance departments have dug in have been issues like this definition of reserves, you know, that the reserves are surplus and that the reserve fund should not be not be included. And these battles that they've been fought have, have been quiet, I think, quietly done and very efficiently done. But I think it's good for everyone to know how important it is. And um, actually, as an example, I can remember it would be 1976. I was working one day a week at the Arcadian, and I report. I went to report a meeting in the in the, the real in the upstairs room at the real of the old county council, and there was one of the the councillors there that was making a very good case about the need. For a, a, a proper water supply in an area. And um, the chairman of the meeting, and, and then the council, which was fine, and then the council said, we've got this money in the reserve fund, I think we should spend the money. And the chairman of the meeting looked really perturbed and kind of looked looked at me and uh, for a moment and, uh, and, uh, and then then said to the council, look, I'm, you can't, I'm sorry, this is absolutely, this, this money is not, for filling, fitting gaps in public expenditure. And I could see what that look to me was, and I thought, I understand. So I thought, I'm not, not I didn't, didn't quote it in the report. And because I didn't, I, I didn't think it, I thought if I quoted it, it would get very complicated. But the look, on, I can remember the look on his face, he was really concerned. And, I, and now, of course, looking back, I can see why, because they had won this power of the reserve fund, and there was a worry, a thought, who knew what would happen, you know, what, would one day something happen, a change of government or a, a new, a, an attitude in the civil service, and could, could it ever be lost? So a number of things that I look back at the past that councillors or officials stand on, I realise now how important it, it was that what they did. Thanks. Um, that was interesting that you brought up the, the issue of islands uh, and the dangers of that. 
um, because I attended a, an online uh, consultation meeting uh, on the democracy uh, matter consultation that's out at the moment on Saturday, and uh, there was a, a feeling like that that some of the questions in there were quite esoteric, but uh, and they were difficult to answer. Um, but uh, one lady who was online said that they'd had a meeting in the northeast of Scotland, and as soon as they brought up the uh, the threat of islands, uh, people very quickly made up their mind where they wanted power to reside, and that was at a local level. So, um, you know, they were very quick to uh, say that they wanted to have power over that. So, um, but one of the other uh, uh, issues that was brought up at that was that there may be not a critical mass uh, within Scottish Government and maybe at Westminster to a uh, champion a uh, devolving powers to islands in the same way as, as that happened previously. But do you have any thoughts on whether uh, going to natural government uh, with a plea to get the types of powers you're talking about would be, uh, you know, fruitful? And I know that Stephen Hedl that talked earlier was on the Commission for Strengthening Local Democracy a few years ago. He might have some views on that too. Mm. It's a very interesting question. I, I think one lesson looking back to that is these were so small local authorities. It was such a huge thing to go to Westminster. You know, they had one MP among 650 or so, and it was nationally so important to get the, the oil on stream. But they managed to make a case, and what they did was simply the case was so it was very calmly made it was very constructively made but it was totally clear and totally logical and it did make so much sense you know it, they made the point simply that it's much better if you've if big developments are planned it's so much better to anticipate what the problems could be that would lead to objections actually see if there's a way that you could head off the head off those those objections at a at an early stage and the lesson again from this was you can actually not only head off the objections you can come up with something that's better so it's a kind of creative thing i i think sometimes i, I sometimes think that in the world today the art of negotiation is being lost so that so often there are situations that it appears to be that you it's either one or the other. There's just two opposites. But the art of negotiation is where people, one side, look at what the other side want and actually work out a way in which they can get what they want in a, in a, in a way that also satisfies one's, one's own side. And I, think, and I think one has to start. You know, and I, I think the lesson from the act is that one shouldn't, Except necessarily that existing legislation is something absolutely iron and you can't change it, you know. And I, I think, you see, this fragmentation in the whole electricity industry, the fragmentation in the, you know, the grid, and others here know much more than I do about it. That came about by a by a chain uh, by a chain of events. Well, it does cause problems, and I'm sure that quite a lot of people in these various agencies recognise it causes problems. So, if one can actually go to them, analyse the problem, talk about, it, and say, look, that problem is going to get worse. Here's actually a, a positive way. Uh, way around it. I think it is. So I, I do think that making a reasonable case is, it, well, I think it's the only way. I think well, the only way to do it is to make a reasonable case. Because I've got the mic, I'm going to jump in on one on that, Howie, because I completely agree with you. And um, so Neil Komoda, Managing Director of EMEC, but also Chair of Orkney Renewable Energy Forum. and. You're absolutely right in the point about renewables coming and some of the issues that can come down the track if we don't gain control and understand what we want and set out what we need as opposed to just react to proposals that are put forward to us. 
and, and I would also argue that there's a lot of work that's been done already um, by local businesses, and I particularly cite Akutera and Gareth Davis and his, and his team, trying to lobby um, in government to try and make changes to some of the ludicrous elements that we have with the, the way the energy industry works at the moment. But we've never really been able to go with one voice. And unfortunately, I would say we've not succeeded in mobilising the, the um, particularly Hans Hans Enterprise as a development agency, seeing this as a, a thing that needed to be done and the, the rules needed to be changed. And similarly, we've not really been able to make much progress in, in getting shoulder to shoulder with the, with the council in terms of doing this. And so I, I genuinely do think you're absolutely right, that there is a big opportunity for us to, to, to get together and set out our, our stall coherently, accurately, politely, but insistently and, and determinedly um, and doggedly, frankly, uh, to try and get what Orkney really needs. So uh, more power to this has been inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Can I also ask you to tell one small story as well? Um, we had a conversation a long time ago about the film Local Hero. Do you remember? Because so, so, the, the piece that comes to mind is there's a, a bit where Burt Lancaster... Uh, has, has everybody seen Local Hero, the film? Yeah. yeah. There's a bit where Burt Lancaster, whose character's name is Harmon, I think you'll find, as opposed to Harmon Hammer. Um, uh, he is talking to his agent who was over in Scotland, complaining about Fulton Mackay, who's got the bothy on the beach. And he, at one point he goes, hey, what's the guy need? Give him what he needs. Give him a piano. What happened in Strongness? What did he have in the town hall? And you you knew Bill, Bill Forsyth? You met Bill Forsyth? Well, I couldn't mention, I never met him, but I can mention the story. And I, I need to remember a bit. I was working at Radio Orkney, and this must have been about 1981. The, the BBC came up. They were filming a George Mackay Brown film. I think it was called Andrina. And there was something in it they wanted. I think maybe I had to say a few words. I can't quite remember, but I remember the, I think it was the BBC producer of the film. He, I think he'd be out to lunch. And I gave him a present of David Sinclair's book, Willock Pearly Brace. I thought he might like, like a, a kind of Orkney book. And I thought no more about it. And it was, and then some years later, and I did wonder when I saw, like, local hero, I, 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 that, that, the mention of the piano, and there was also something. I just there was something rather lovely about local. Too many lovely things about local hero, um, and then, um, and then I, some years passed, and I had a conversation one day with somebody in a local hotel, who said that there'd been inquiry about Orkney um, being where Local Hero would be filmed. and But they said, oh, no, they didn't think that the, the hotel would be big enough and they didn't think they would be... And they, would, they were probably quite realistic, realistic at the time. And then I remembered something, and I, as I say, I'm, this is only from memory, I had the feeling that Bill Forsyth was um, the, the director or the... Well, involved in in that bbc one so uh, this is only pure speculation you know so i wondered and then i, I wondered was it a case that um, did the man i gave the copy of the book, <laughs> did he show it to bill for price you know and, and i don't know and i always wondered i'd like to approach bill for Scythe and ask him but i never kind of i didn't know quite how to broach it but but as i say it it would be a rather wonderful thing in this chain of events you know if somehow um uh, the story of, of willa in flotter and i think it'd be rather nice for the people of Fl flotter if in some way it had had um had an effect, you know been connected to local hero <laughs> Yeah, sorry for coming in again. I mean, I think your, your call to action or your call to ambition there is well made. And uh, I, I mean, I have to wonder whether we're making the most of the, the powers that we do have. I mean, the, during the, the, the course of the Orange of the Future, what we, what we went after both governments, 
and was thought about uh, maybe doing revision of the Orkney County Council Act 1974, then decided, well, we could lose things by doing that, so let's just leave it well alone. Uh, but we did manage to get the Islands Act, and then the Islands Act can request the transfer of powers. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the aim behind all this was an element of trying to become a one-stop shop for marine developments around licensing, planning, and indeed the ownership of the seabed. And uh, we made some progress on the, the Crown Estate, and we have our, mm -hmm. uh, marine licensing planning partnership. So it's kind of works in progress and things that we should maybe chase a bit harder. Uh, but, yeah, are we doing enough with the re request for the transfer of powers? I mean, I would say the answer is obviously no, because we've never done one. But the, as you said, the, uh, the, the fragmentation of the, the, the energy market and the, the whole reserve nature of the electricity side of things works against this because we, we can't go after the Scottish government for that anyway. Mm -hmm. But what we do have is what you pointed out in the, the County Council Act, uh, which was to get beyond just having the feeling you can do nothing except in the context of planning is the work license side of things. And I don't know when was the last time we, we tried to do works licensing uh, since Flora, uh, but I wonder if there's anything in that that we, we could be trying to flex for a muscle so. That's yeah. That's interesting. I I do think, and well, I think first of all, you know, I think going to the just simply going to speak speak to the various agencies and which i think in some cases will not know of the, the potential problems ahead of them you know the the people involved in transmission in the national grid i don't think have thought of the, what could happen because i'm absolutely sure about the, the bad publicity you know there's there really is no question if one really outsized poll just one appeared it would create, and, and everybody loses out of that, that bad publicity. And that would certainly mean that people wanting to prevent any further lines would simply object to whatever re re renewable energy came. So there's a case for simply going to these various agencies, I guess draw, drawing, up a, uh, drawing up a plan, going to the various agencies and saying, look, first of all, there are real problems there. These problems would hit you to be detriment of Scotland, the detriment of the UK, but there is a way around it. And I think it's just going and, and making that case. And it is surprising. I mean, it did surprise me with that legislation. You know, going away back, somebody had said that why doesn't Orkney basically create its own international oil port? I think people would have said, oh, we never, you know, we would never do it. We'd never get the power or we could never do it, but they did it, you know, and so many then skilled and able people um, were brought together to do it. So I, I think it's it's getting the vision or, or actually identifying the solution. And I think if a solution's good, you know, it can actually, it can actually be sold. Just, if I, just to go on to say, you see, I think one classic situation is, you know, cost, because somebody will say, oh, well, here's a case where it really would be worth putting a cable underground. But then somebody will say, ah, oh, but our rules say that in such and such a situation, it, it doesn't, there's certain things about a cost. Well, the absolute worst comes to the worst, at least if a community has the power to say, well, okay, um, we accept that looking at the, these figures, this cost is in. Will you at least give us the opportunity to um, cover some of that cost? You know, at, but at least to be involved in the negotiation. And I think the danger is then that you get procedures, you know, documents and procedures at, in this fragmentation, and then people go ahead, and then one thing kind of leads to another. And it's, but I think in the interests of all the players in renewables, in the businesses, the, the renewables industry generally, the UK and Scotland's national aims, I think in all of those, the council filling the gaps, you know, putting together a structure that makes it clearer, makes the way ahead clearer, removes problems, 
I think just by doing that, there's an immediate benefit. There's a sort of tactical benefit. Like if there is a gap, whoever comes in and says, look, we're prepared, to, we've got solutions and we're prepared to work and work and, and solve that gap. I think you start with a, with, start in, in a good position. Well, I'd just make one other point for, for information, really. Um, in terms of the transition grid, so what's proposed at the moment is an extension to the grid. At the moment, we have two, effectively 30 megawatt cables that come to Orkney, and the proposals that will lead to the Finstown substation, et cetera, mm -hmm. will be another 220 megawatts of capacity. There are estimates that say that there could be three or 4,000 megawatts of electricity in the water around Orkney. So the question then is going to be, is Finstown the end game or a step along the way? In addition to that, the work we've been doing with hydrogen and the work that we can see coming with synthetic fuels made from hydrogen suggests that there may actually be a way of getting the energy out that's not purely on, on pylons. So burying a pipeline is a lot easier than getting a load of cables all the way down the A9. Equal to think cartoon image for the purposes of illustration. Um, so I think there is an opportunity for us to try and press for better solutions. Now I have to say, I'm very impressed by the the, um, the undertaking we've had from the, the Courtney Heritage Society has had from the council in terms of the proposals to underground the cables from the council substation, the council's wind farms to the substations in order to make sure there's a minimum impact. And I think that leadership is really, really commendable. Um, and could actually set a useful precedent for encouraging the other developers to also underground their cables. Because one of the challenges we're going to have is with changing climate, we are going to see more weather events that are going to threaten our electricity infrastructure. Denmark had exactly this problem in the 90s, and they then decided to deal with it by burying all of their cables, I think it's up to, 100, up to 33 kilovolts. So if we were in Denmark, there would be no overhead power lines in Orkney at all. Now, the UK has chosen not to do that. It's chosen to take a cheap way and stick a bunch of timber poles in the field and, and put wire between them. And that is going to represent a significant threat to society in the long term, because as we get worse weather, that, that network is going to be harder to maintain and be more threatened. And at that very time, we will not have oil heating our houses, and we will not have petrol driving our cars. So I do think there's an opportunity for us to, to set out a vision for where we could be and what needs to happen for the, for the economy of Orkney as a whole, not just from a, from a cosmetic or an aesthetic point of view, but from a practical societal security point of view. And that's not, a, that's not an image that I'm hearing articulated at the moment. It's a very good point about the, the changing weather. I can remember, again, working at Radio Morton, it must be back in the late 70s, when a real spell of weather came and um, snow fell, there was a, a thaw and then it froze. And then the sheer weight of ice brought down the cables, brought down a big number of cables. And what was amazed us, made me anyway, was the knock-on effect, because not only when the electricity goes down, it affects so many other things. It was affecting, I think, the telephone exchange at one time had a problem because of the power, the water pumps. There was a whole chain of things. It was just how quickly it happened. It's just a change, a change in the weather. So, and indeed, the predictions are that we're going to get more, more events like that. Spencer, thank you for the floor. Because you won't do that. <laughs> right. Is anybody, is, uh, anybody else want to ask anything? Or... Anyway, uh, I, I think we had high hopes that this talk would be thought provoking, very useful. I think we, none of us, I think, will be disappointed from this. So um, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Howie for doing this talk, and uh, it's really so worthwhile, uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs>